One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, that's great. We've got it nine. We can absolutely start. Howard, you ready? I'm ready. All right. Welcome to our monthly, in this case, March meeting of the Transportation Committee. Um, we have, a, as usual, a pretty full agenda. Um, our first item is going to be a discussion of speeding issues on 79th Street between Columbus and Amsterdam Avenues. Uh, I did go out with Mark uh, Diller, who was on here, and Dale Brown from the Block Association, and uh, another gentleman from the Block Association, and we watched the block for a, for a good hour, hour and a half um, about a week ago, and we discovered some things. I reported some of these to Colleen, but I want to repeat them now because we are in a public session. Um, pretty much the speeding was, and Dale and Mark, please jump in if I'm saying anything incorrectly, but the speeding was largely eastbound. Um, westbound, there was enough traffic that speeding was not an issue. Westbound also has the M79 bus, which eastbound does not. And we did notice that there are some things that need to be done that could be done to make this block safer. Um, and we discussed some of those. I noticed that obviously you cannot go north if you're on this block going east from Amsterdam. You can only go south on Columbus. So we, we believe there might, it might be a good idea to have a sign on 79th Street west of Amsterdam saying, northbound traffic turn here because some people may end up on the block between Amsterdam and Columbus and not know that they must go south from there. So we think that could be a safety measure. Um, in addition, there is a school near Amsterdam on the south side, Road of Shalom School. There are no school signs anywhere on the block. <clears throat> and uh, we think there should be those school zone, um, you know, slow down school, whatever those signs say, uh, we believe that should be there. Um, Colleen, we did have one question. Do you know of any place where there is a bus in one direction only and the other direction you have placed speed bumps? DOT has put speed bumps because people were asking if that was a possibility on the south side of 79th Street for eastbound traffic. You know what, Andrew? No, there hasn't. Hi, everyone. It's Colleen Chattergoon from City Department of Transportation. And the policy is that um, we would not put speed humps on a street where it's a truck route. I mean, a, a truck route, um, right. a bus route, or a snow emergency route. Okay. Those are the, yeah. So it, okay. 79th Street would not qualify for a speed hump because- Okay, it's a bus road. route westbound <laughs> on the north side only. You understand that. But it is still a truck route. I get that. Yes, it's still a truck route. Yeah. Um, as far as the- um, School zone signage, um, you can investigate that, of course, and the yeah. possibility, yeah. De definitely, we'll be more than happy to look at the um, signage for the school uh, to see what uh, we can install there so that motorists know that there is a school nearby and we can look at the additional sign that you mentioned as well. Thank you, and I neglected uh, to ask if there was anybody who could do tonight's minutes. Um, I can certainly fill you in on what we have said thus far, but uh, we should we should be taking the minutes. Um, any volunteers tonight? Should be relatively uh, easy, but thunderous <laughs> response. <laughs> That's a lot of don't hands going up. We'll fight over this now. It's going to be the shortest minutes based on what I've seen. I'm trying to help you out here. <laughs> Someone's going to have to draw the stick. Someone's going to get a draw the stick here. We're going to go eeny, meeny, miny. Yeah, we, we're trying to alternate so nobody I'll, gets. I'll do it, but I've done more than my fair share. And you I, sure have. And That's I why you should. I think that every person should take take a chance. I, I'll I'll do, do it. I'll do it. Roberta's offered to do it. That's very Thank nice. you so Roberta. much, Roberta. I just have and to I'll go fill get you a in. Pad. You have to give me a minute because I have to get a pad. No okay. problem. We'll wait. Um, so Dale, um, if, if, you, if you would like to speak and, and say something, I saw your, your question in chat, which was, 
our speed cameras possible on this block. So Andrew, I'm going to, I'm going to promote Dale and just from our little session, right. I'm going to go over to her name you, as your co -pro, co co host. You see where it says promote to panelists. We'll move Dale in. We'll let her speak for a little bit. Then you can move her out. So Dale. Okay. Dale, let me do that. I did it already. Maybe you move. Oh, around. you did it. Okay, great. So Dale, uh, yeah, and, and you could you could use video if you choose to, but uh, you're, but um, it's your opportunity to speak. With Great. Thank you very much. Um, as Andrew said, we did have a meeting because we have been more and more concerned about the speeding happening on 79th Street. The fact that we do have the school on the south side of the street. And at number 117, they have gutted that building and that will be housing for senior citizens, 62 years old and up. And so we will have on the north side of the street, which is closer to Columbus, um, a senior citizen housing of um, micro apartments where they have kitchenettes and bathrooms. And on the south side of the street towards Amsterdam, we have the school. Um, we also spoke with Andrew about maybe getting bolder white lines um, across the street that would make people slow down a little bit more. We do know that once the Gilder Center is up and running, our block is going to be horrible. Aside from all the pedestrian traffic, we're going to have so many vehicular traffic going east to Columbus Avenue. And although there is the, the entrance of the Gilder Center is at the bottom of our block on the east side of the street, um, and there's no parking, we know that people are going to be lining up there, zipping across Columbus Avenue, trying to uh, drop off passengers. And we have a major, major concern because of the senior folks that are there and also the children that do walk down Columbus Avenue to go to school. And um, we just really can't have that speeding. Also on the corner of um, 79th, the Northwest corner, the building 101 has some construction that's going on. And then two doors up at 117, this is the building that they're gutting for the senior citizens. So there are um, dumpsters there. Sometimes there are trucks that are double parked, which means when the Crosstown bus is going westbound and they take that right-hand turn at 79th and Columbus, they sometimes have to go to the eastbound lane in order to complete that, that turn. Um, we, re we really need help um, because the situation is only going to escalate once the Gilder Center comes in. And um, we have got to slow these cars down. We know that we're going to be getting a lot more traffic at that point. And you know, we, we really need help from the committee We'd like these bolder lines. I don't know if we can get speed cameras in, if that's feasible, but also um, I, I was very interested in the suggestion that Andrew made in regards to signage and signage being put up, indicating that uh, West 79th Street going east is not a through street, unless you wanna try and drive through the museum, which would not work out too well. Um, but maybe that would cut down on some of the traffic that goes north on eastbound on 79th Street. So we really need help from your committee. And Colleen, we certainly need help from you. Thank you. Hi, thank it's, you, it's Colleen. Um, thank you so much for that. We would be more than happy to work with the center once um, the construction is completed. Um, and, you know, everything is set, you know, we can come out there and we can see what we can do to mitigate any safety measures um, to implement. Any idea when the um, center will be open? No, I don't know. They're on the fifth floor. 
not right till now. 20, I'm sorry. What, Barbara? 2024. Okay. Well, let's let's have the conversation um, <clears throat> by then. Once the center is in, you know, full effect, then it's open. We can definitely evaluate that. Okay. Well, we certainly don't want to wait to to make the streets safer until 2024. I think there's some things we can do now. We we exactly we can do that with what you recommended, Andrew. But in terms of analyzing and looking at you know the center as a whole with seniors there, you know we would have to do that once the center is completed. But in the interim, we can look at the signage, we can look at the speed camera, and we could look at you know if markings need to refurbish, we can do that. Thank you, thank you. That would be great, and I'm we're happy to meet you out there at some point and show you what we're talking about, so you can visualize it better. Um, you know the placement of certain signage, uh, school zones location I, signage. If if you and, if you can just send me you know a letter stating that you know there's a school there at that particular location, we will do the evaluation to determine where we can install the signage. Great, we'll give you the exact, well, Dale knows the address right now. Uh, um, well, it's two addresses. It's um, 168. Andrew, you put and I have to, I, I think, and I think it's also- You can look it up, Dale. Don't, yeah, don't, you'll have to look it up. But we'll I look do it up. wanna- We'll get it to I you, do, Colleen. I do wanna point out that the housing um, where the building is being gutted should be up and running in less than 18 months. So I'm very concerned also when they they move in um, because- The senior housing, you mean, on the north side? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and, and they, they say they'll be completed in about 18 months. And um, we know that there will be a few people that uh, will be in wheelchairs because there will be an outside elevator for the handicapped people like that. But most of them are ambulatory and they're actually in, in pretty good physical condition. Um, but and I do Mark Filler did the just lines. put the address uh, that you said, 168 Se West. 117 West 79th Street. No, no, That's I'm talking about the uh, school, the Road of Shalom oh, School, school. 168 West 79. Oh, there, good. And, and it's, it's oh. Colleen again. And we, and we can look at um, installing ambulatory signage once the, um, you know, the institution is uh, fully, you know, in, in, in effect where people are actually there, um, you know, getting uh, the treatment that they need uh, or visiting. We, we can definitely look at that. Correct. Right. And signage. Mark just put that address up, 117 West 79. And we have some hands raised. Um, so let's take the first one, Ken. Yeah, um, Ms. Brown, thank you for bringing this uh, concern to our committee. Um, uh, I, think, I don't think we should be surprised that there's speeding on the street. It's a four lane highway, uh, completely unobstructed. Um, the reason you don't have, as Andrew mentioned, cars speeding more going west is that there's uh, more traffic going west and that tends to hinder speeding. Um, uh, the fact that there is less traffic going east suggests to me that there's a lot of room to play around with there in terms of reconfiguring the street so that it's a truly neighborhood street and not a four lane traffic artery, which is what it looks like to a driver right now. And so signs, I'm, I'm sorry, are, are might help on the margins, but it's not going to solve the problem. Uh, what you need to do is stop uh, and the... Um, Does anyone know what the status of the Rotunda reconstruction project is? I haven't finished, Howard. Oh, sorry. Um, we, we, we need to sort of end the denotations to drivers that um, there's nothing uh, in their way for an entire block to just floor it um, because enforcement is not going to do it either. Um, you know, the, the cops can't be everywhere. Um, so it's really incumbent upon our committee and, and upon DOT to uh, remake streets so that uh, the indications to driver, the signals to drivers are, um, are uh, that they need to go slow and there are ways to do it. And uh, that's what we should be looking at. 
Uh, Howard, did you want to well, say I just, something? I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ken. I, I agree completely with your point that this, this problem is not unique to 79th Street. Um, 79th Street has the, what made me think of it is 79th Street has the entrance and exit to the uh, West Side Highway. And I was wondering, I, I just don't know, uh, it was a big issue uh, well over a year ago, what the status of the Rotunda project is. I know it's a slightly different topic, but I'm just curious if anyone knew. Yeah, the, Colleen, do you have any idea when construction is set to begin on that? So I know there hasn't been any changes in terms of the status. I know the project is moving uh, forward. I can get you the latest. I can email the board the latest tomorrow on it. That'd be that great. That should not be a problem. That's yeah. great. I know Amtrak is part of that work because they have That's to replace their, their, yeah. Oh, okay, Barbara, you were next. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to point out that this is the same street that I've been squawking about for such a long time that I said was, I thought, one of the 10 most dangerous streets. So I completely concur with Dale. The traffic does absolutely speed there, but I wanted to ask Dale, because this has been my experience. I was nearly killed on that block, crossing the street, going from east to west or west to east on 79. Then I'm wondering if, Dale, if you living on that block, if you've had the same experience where the cars are swerving one way and coming the other direction on the other way, turning north onto Amsterdam. Have you had that experience also? Um, yes, we have. Um, I will say that the traffic lights were changed by Columbus Avenue and 79th Street, yes. but they really have not been changed by Amsterdam right. and 79th Street. Um, when, when you're going eastbound, there is a turning light for people to take a left to go up Amsterdam Avenue. But if you're crossing from 79th Street from the east side of the street to the west side of the street, it does become very dangerous. And then we have some issues of the bicyclists who go both ways. And, you know, aside from dodging the cars, you have to also dodge um, the bicycles. So yes, there, there is definitely a problem there. There used to be a lot of accidents there. And also there used to be a lot of accidents on Broadway and 79th Street too, which covers our block. Our block association goes from um, the east side, the, west, the east side of Broadway all the way to Columbus. So yes, we have a problem with that light. Many of um, block members have mentioned something about it. Can they have a delayed walk sign? Um, you know, can the people not always be turning onto Amsterdam Avenue? Can there just be a stop for everybody so people can walk safely across the street? I believe we changed that traffic light. Um, it, the phasing, several years. It was. The phasing was yeah. changed slightly, but it really did not solve it's it. It's safer now to cross from the north to the south side of 79th Street on the east side of Amsterdam. That yes. is safer now. But not uh, as but, but the other west side is still, yeah, uh, is, and we need we need it. to do something about that. Yes, and that's right. why yeah. I suggested that. We're, we're, I think Dale, Dale was suggesting the same thing, where the traffic comes to a four-way stop and allows people to cross where they want to cross. That is a really dangerous intersection. Yeah, that's that's something that the signal can absolutely uh, fix or or certainly right. d minimize. Um, so, um, Doug, you're next. I just, um, I, I don't doubt that there's a speeding problem. And I was just curious having you, obviously Dale is here and, and I understand that you uh, were there with- And Mark, Mark Diller is here who lives on the block. Yes, and that Mark and Andrew were there for, you said, for a long period of time. What did you observe? What type of vehicles do you, did you happen to see speeding or, or you, is, are they delivery vehicles? Are they Ubers? Are no, they passenger private vehicles? cars. And private cars and also, um, you're seeing the, the prevalence of the speeding going from east to west. West to east. I'm sorry, west. You can't really speed east to west because there's much more traffic and uh, your, your speed is, is, you know, delineated by how much cars and truck traffic and bus and the buses. So I'm just guessing. So, so if, they're, if they're going from west to east, they're not, they may have been coming off of the West Side Highway, possibly, or they may have just made the right turn off of Amsterdam. Yeah, or they may be coming off the highway. And if they're not familiar with the neighborhood and its traffic pattern, they may be on that block not knowing they must go south from there. Right. Which is I why I'm wanna... suggesting the sign northbound traffic turn here. 
by I Amsterdam. Do, I do also want to point out that when we met, it was on a Sunday. And believe it or not, there was a lot of traffic. There is a lot more traffic during the weekday. weekday. And although we get trucks, we don't get them from the Gilder Center because this is an agreement with the um, museum that none of their trucks will go up and down 79th Street. But there are other trucks because there's other construction in the area that also go up and down the street and they travel really kind of quickly. Um, we also have now that school is open, the Rota Shalom school is open, we have school buses. And unfortunately we have people that are also double parking. And so when people are speeding and you've got double parked cars, you're, you're, you're just looking for an accident for to park. happen. Yeah. Um, but when we did view it on a Sunday, there was a lot of traffic. There was. Mostly yeah. westbound, but yeah. I, I, I absolutely was just right. curious if you had a, uh, you know, and again, it doesn't matter because whether you're speeding on one block or you're speeding for five blocks, it doesn't matter. But I'm curious if there are people that happen to be coming off the highway. And, you know, because there is a, there is a uh, propensity for people to continue at a higher rate of speed when they've gotten off of a highway. And it's a problem, it, you know, it's, it's the adjustment. So I just, I'm just curious who these- yeah, and, and there may be some are. folks who believe that if you stay on 79th Street after exiting at the Henry Hudson Parkway, you can get to the east side, right. not knowing that you must go up to 81st Street. I, I have a feeling there are some people on that block that didn't know that that, that was the case. Um, so that's why signage would be of some help to the, in that regard. So um, it's- it it's Colleen. Um, when we go out there to do our analysis, we're going to look at the speeding in the morning, the noon, and the PM to see, yes. um, it, to, just to let you know, to, to, to see what's really going on there. And going back to the signage, I think that would really be helpful, you know, to look at. And the Gilda Center, we would be more than happy to help out with, you know, appropriate signage once the center is open. We, we can revisit that but in the interim, I, you know, I'd like to look at the signage and speed cameras to see what we can um, do to, you know, reduce the speeding on the block. And, you know, our spiel is speeding is an enforcement, but we, we, we all know that the local precinct can be at everywhere, you know, possibly, you know, to deal with enforcement. So if we can make, you know, that improvement with, you know, signage or reengineering, we're more than happy to do that. Great, thank you, Colleen. Thank you. Uh, Mark, did you wanna add some, some things? I see your hand up. Thanks, uh, just a couple of clarification points. There is a leading pedestrian interval um, at, um, at Amsterdam in 79th. My impression, but this is not scientific, my impression is that cars, the, the speeding cars very often are cars that are caught in the queue behind people waiting to make the left-hand turn onto Amsterdam. And then when they see an open road in front of them, they start hauling, you know what? Um, there is a Barnes dance at, um, at 79th and Columbus, and that is a terrific thing, which I hope we don't mess with. Um, and um, uh, so one of the other things that I was hoping that Colleen might include in her take back is the, something that somebody mentioned before, but I didn't hear Colleen pick up, pick that one up, which was the road markings themselves. Um, the, um, uh, yeah, they're a bit faded, yep. Well, and, and you remember on West 70th Street by PS 199, um, I think it was Roberta actually who brought it to everybody's attention first, but uh, the idea of painting the, the lanes more narrowly so that you had, a, you had the sluice effect. Um, and uh, there was some research that a community member sent me that talked about the salutary effects of robust um, lane markings uh, on driver behavior. Um, th those things might be something to consider. And then Colleen, when you do your analysis, it would be great if somebody could be there sort of, uh, if, if by PM you mean after five o'clock, um, because after school lets out and Rosh Shalom has a late release or a late dismissal because their classes tend to run longer than a public school does. So um, it would be great to have um, somebody there, you know, say around five or six o'clock because uh, I think that's when the roadway opens up and people are really, and then people start opening up the accelerator. Thanks for letting me uh, jump in. Sure, and, and that's, that's the time that we're usually out there. If you can specify that 
in the letter that you'll be sending to us, that would be helpful. And the other thing, we can look at the roadway markings to refurbish them, definitely. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank um, you. We have a couple more hands. Uh, Rich, go ahead. Yeah, so a few thoughts. Um, one is that I think there are two issues that are complementary. Uh, one is the site specific, so 79th Street itself. The other is just a holistic feeling in the district about whether or not you can get away with speeding. And I think that addressing one of just the site specific on 79th Street without looking district wide um, it is hard to do. Um, on on the site specific, I agree with Ken that putting up signs uh, is unlikely to have too much differ is that I think really an entry to the district and an entry off the highway. We should have really big, clear signs as people are getting off the highway saying, you know, speed limit 25, strictly enforced. And just don't really be, setting the tone. Don't forget the no right on red in New York City. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, another issue we have is um, the left turn from 79th Street onto Amsterdam. We just called on DOT to try to remove left turns in bad intersections. And, um, you know, we're basically forcing cars that want to go north uh, either to turn on Amsterdam or to go around the block. Uh, I'm a little hesitant to make clear signs saying turn left here because we don't want cars turning left. So that's something to factor in just how that plays with our overall uh, dislike of left turns. Um, but then uh, on a broader basis, I think of certain areas and my favorite one is Long Beach Island where, it, you know, if you're on the, the boulevard on Long Beach Island, they have a strict 35 mile per hour speed limit even though like 79th Street, it's two lanes each way, it feels more like a highway. And you know, if you're going 36 miles per hour in Long Beach Island on the boulevard, you're gonna get a ticket. And I think we need more of that just pervasive, holistic district-wide feeling that if you're speeding, you're at risk of getting a ticket. And the one thing about 79th Street is because it is an entry point, it's a great place for really stepped up enforcement to set that tone of, you know, wow, they really strictly enforce the speed limit in this district. And I just feel overall that we don't have enough of that feeling district wide that if you're going five, 10 miles per hour over the speed limit, you're guaranteed you're going to get a speed limit. And I think it's kind of the opposite where drivers feel that, you know, there just aren't that many cops. You, very rarely see cars getting speeding tickets. We know that very few officers are trained on radar and we just don't have nearly enough enforcement to create that overall perception of speeding is just not tolerated in the district. And I think we need that far beyond 79th Street, but with 79th Street really being, a, being centered to it because it is a big entry point. Yeah, we've, so we've requested. We've requested uh, signs um, at both the 95th, 96th Street exit of Henry Hudson Parkway and 79th Street, because in many, in many times, those are a car's first mile on, on, New, on New York City streets or on New York streets at all. They could be coming from Jersey. They could be coming from Pennsylvania. They could be coming from Ohio or California. That's why we need signage where your first time in the city is. No right on red, speed limit 25, slow down, you will be ticketed, you know, things to that, to that nature. And if we have to go to get our state officials, because obviously it's a state highway, we may have to do that. And uh, I'm sure um, our assembly persons would not be, would not object to this. Um, Ken, you had your hand up again? Yes, I we did. do have to move on. Okay. Um, you, know, you do have some, two people in the audience and a QA. and I see that. Okay. Yep, I will get to them. I want to take my committee first. Yep. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just curious about the committee's um, reluctance to uh, look at what's proven to uh, slow down cars, and that's infrastructure changes on the street. Um, uh, this block uh, could be kind of a test case in our neighborhood to really turn it into a neighborhood street. There's no reason why 
uh, this block of 79th that ends up at a T intersection at the Museum of Natural History um, needs to uh, be four, four unobstructed lanes, which is, uh, as, um, as Mark so put it so well, um, you just have the open road ahead when you're on the street. Mm -hmm. And we need to, um, we need to stop uh, sending that signal to drivers. That's really what's going to solve this problem. Um, so um, I would urge the committee to think more creatively about this, think boldly. And also I'd ask Colleen, what uh, traffic calming um, tools that does uh, DOT have in its toolbox that uh, could be trotted out to, uh, to address this other than just um, signage? And I, I think, Ken, we're not ignoring other things. Um, in fact, Mark's idea about what we did on 70th Street uh, about um, painting and, and, and the curb narrowing, uh, you know, the lane narrowing due to uh, the paint on the street may, may work on the eastbound side of this street and slow people down, as well as all of the other measures we're talking about. So we're going to look at everything. We haven't dismissed anything. But Colleen, yeah, perhaps you'd like to answer. I think the markings um, are important because it gives a sense of, you know, letting motorists know whether, you know, um, to, not whether, but gives the motorists a sense of, you know, knowing that they have to slow down, you know, that yep. sp speeding is something um, that, you know, you know, that where the markings, you know, are, are aligned properly, that they, you know, they would know that they don't have to speed or and I think the other thing is, you know, what would be helpful is maybe a speed camera because that, believe it or not, it does work um, where, you know, as someone will get a ticket not knowing that, of course, there's a camera there. And when they do know um, the location, you know, they'll refrain from the speeding. Well, we have, we have requests for speed cameras for quite a few locations. If, if we can get them, we'll take them. I, yeah, I the know. problem is we're, we're limited uh, to the number and- Numbers, and, exactly. Uh, still. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and- you know, they get moved around, but um, how about for instance, uh, a mid block bulb out um, or a couple of them? That would, uh, I think go a long way. What you wanna do is create uncertainty on the part of drivers. That's what slows them down. I mean, if the community board wants us to look at that, we, you know, we'd be more than happy to do so. Again, if you can put that in your resolution, you know, to us, uh, we can do so. And I think that would probably, you know, be something in the long term. I don't want to say short term where we could you know, implement this in a few months. We would have to study it very carefully. Yeah, um, I, I, I see your, your, uh, your chat message, Mark, and I think you, you're probably right about that. Um, although that was a... Uh, that was a traffic signal that we were asking for on 106th Street. Um, we have a couple of community folks that would like to speak. Peter, you're first. I'll work with it. You have to allow them to talk and I'm gonna allow Peter to talk just so you know and you scroll over his mic and that's how you do that. So Peter, you're up. Okay, hi, thank you for um, this. Um, wanted to just say that this is a district-wide problem and um, needs to be addressed. It's, um, we, we've got the same problem on Amsterdam, which has a bike lane and it's um, <clears throat> just, um, it's really disturbing. Um, I'll leave it there. Um, we need more enforcement. We need, um, I have uh, put it into the chat just that um, the precinct has offered me a, um, what I think they called an intermittent light sign, which is connected to um, a speed um, monitor um, so that we could put that out there for um, uh, cars to or vehicles to get a sense of how fast they're going. Um, just way too many of them seem way uh, too fast for me. And with the, once we reopen the streets after, at, at the end of um, the night uh, at eight o'clock, on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, it's just amazing how fast they're going. And um, it is a real problem. So this is something that I would love to see some 
something done about enforcement. I mean, I've thought about whether we could um, ask the police to uh, allow the uh, parking police, the traffic police to um, become uh, involved in monitoring and, and, and ticketing for speeding because it would be a quick way to generate money and to send a message that this is just unacceptable. And it's not, it's also reckless driving. I, I mean, they're, they're passing other cars and um, uh, going right next to parked cars or next to um, uh, places where people could be coming out um, in between vehicles um, that are parked and or getting out of cars with and opening their doors, things like that. Okay. So, um, just this, this I wanted to emphasize how much this is a district-wide issue, and it applies not just to a side street, but also to the avenues. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Um, we have one more uh, public speaker, Abby. Um, you're unmuted, I believe. So. Oh yes. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me in. Sure. Uh, can you hear me at all, please? But we hear you fine. All right, thank you. I was just thinking if we're talking about DOT and having the place redesigned, it is gonna take a long time, it's gonna take a while. But the best way to go would be to have something set up immediately. That way, it could be road bumps, it could be getting drivers to go a different way. because that's an area where a lot of people live. Sorry, my phone just got in. Hello? Yeah, we hear you. Yes, that's an area where a lot of people live and um, there are families and kids there and um, I'll be happy to have something set up immediately to curb these because Problem is when people come up the highway, they're still in the mode of uh, driving very fast and changing lanes. And um, with road pumps, that might be one way of slowing them down. With them having someone set uh, a big mark or something to let them know that kids live there, that would be good as well. But anything that could slow people down will really work. Also bike lanes is another thing in the area. Um, I've been around there a few times and the biggest problem I have is getting bikes coming at me whilst I'm looking out for cars. I think that is uh, something else that needs to be uh, looked into. But um, like I said, something that could be done immediately would be nice. Thank you. I don't, Thank I don't you. know if anyone agrees with me. Uh, well, everybody's... Uh, Got their, their feelings on how to do this, which is why we're going to look at everything. Uh, I think there's some things we can do sooner rather than later. Um, Colleen, do you want, uh, would you like us to arrange to meet you out there so we can uh, size up the situation, so to speak? Um, Andrew. Or would uh, you prefer to get a letter from us first? I would how, prefer how? a letter. I would prefer a letter. Okay. Yeah. We will work on that. We will draft something. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we move on to our next topic or are there still hands on this? Andrew, I think there's a question in the Q&A and then I have a comment. Uh, Lisa Ormond asked if there was crossing guards uh, for the school. Does anybody know that? Yes. Uh, um, yeah, there's a crossing guard at 79th um, uh, uh, on the east side of Amsterdam. Um, and there's another one further down Amsterdam, I believe. Okay. Then, then I would just add, uh, believe it or not, uh, a lifetime ago, I lived on that block uh, a couple buildings away from Mark. But I didn't know him at the time, but uh, I did. Uh, I always found the biggest issue was the hill in the middle of the 79th Street block. And I always very concerned about the people coming off, believe it or not, down Columbus, who are frustrated that they were in traffic, they'd make a right, and they speed up that hill. Uh, my apartment was right on the other side at the time my son was about four years old and we were always hanging outside. Um, and I don't know how to take that hill into consideration, but I do believe that it leads to the speeding, um, uh, both sides, but particularly I actually found the other one. And if you're talking about coming off the highway, there's always traffic coming off the highway. I do think it's a little led because when you come off 79th, you do hit that sort of high hill and it's always, 
they're usually got a backup. So I think it slows it down a bit. But if you want to talk about enforcement, there's always a police officer there grabbing people making left. So if you want to ask them to uh, move down and take into consideration speeding as well, but there's actually a police officer on that particular intersection quite a bit. To stop people from going left on Riverside, you mean? Well, I don't know if they stop them, but they sure ticket them. But uh, it's a big ticket spot to make them go left. Well, maybe we need to ask the precinct to move those officers around. And well, that's, that's my point. If you want to say yeah. there is somebody on 79th quite a bit, you know, so if you ask them, perhaps we can say, can you move them up a little bit too? And ticket speeders. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. uh, I think that's one of the things that they do. That's helpful to know that there is police presence out there. So maybe they can shift them around a bit to, you know, to we will them. ask. Yeah. It's a big spot. It's a standard spot to look for people making a left turn that they're not supposed to. And, there's quite a few tickets there for anybody who, who takes that, who's there often. So again, maybe that's a suggestion as well. But I do think that Hill is something that definitely should come into consideration uh, because you get, it's a very high hill between Amsterdam and Columbus and people make that right after they're frustrated on 79th of sort of getting stuck in the traffic and they zoom up. To like to get they're just annoyed that they've been in that traffic and that hill is very dangerous and I think it adds to the speeding fact. Yeah, that's that's a fine that's a fine idea. And um, so we have a we have a number of things that we need to consider on this topic. And um, I don't know that we're going to solve this tonight, but we're going to get a letter out to Colleen expressing all of these uh, issues and possibilities and ask DOT to. Uh, meet us out there and uh, we can visually uh, take in everything and we can and then everybody can see exactly the tr the behavior if we have to we'll make it a nice day if we have to be down uh, at Riverside and walk up entirely I think some people get frustrated and they speed up because they've had lights and traffic coming up the hill from from the highway and then they think they can just speed we absolutely must tell them this is not a through street to the east side though I think that's that's imperative I think people are there who might not otherwise be there. Will the committee um, have input into that letter? I'm will sorry? The, will the committee have input into that letter? Of course. Okay. Of course. It, so I have two questions. If, if we're calling for, Ken brought up the idea of street design changes. Is that something we should have a resolution now? And and the idea of the committee going to meet with DOT is kind of counter to um, our usual approach of just saying to DOT, there's a problem here. Can you have your experts identify recommended solutions? Um, so, I think we know what the problems are, uh, Rich. Um, we've been out there and we've watched it happen right before our eyes. Um, you know, I, I don't so, think, I'm personally not so ready call for a redesign. For a, does it call for a resolution though, calling for um, traffic calming efforts as well as signage? A and separately, and picking up on what Peter had said, should we have a separate resolution um, calling for both DOT and the police department, but especially the police department to really work on slowing down traffic in the district, uh, stepping up on giving speeding tickets, which again, the, uh, the precincts don't have the capacity to do. And so we're really depending on um, the NYPD uh, transit uh, cops who are more trained in speeding tickets, but to have more of a, a, a district-wide slowdown effort, which I think is really essential. And it, I think again, getting it goes in touch, way beyond. Getting in touch with the two precincts, I think I don't is. Think you, know, you just need to talk was, to them. Yeah, we, have, we need to just talk to them. Exactly. We don't need a resolution to, for the police exactly. to. Uh, to do this, we, we have a relationship with them uh, and, and Mark right. Diller does and Steve does and- And I do. And, and Roberta does. So I think we can just speak to them. Hey, Andrew, it's Colleen. Yeah. I think- In, in which 20... case it should call us. Hold on, please, Rich. Go ahead, Colleen. I think in, in informing your resolution or letter, whichever you choose to send, um, I think you should form it in such a way where you're asking DOT to look at the signage, um, the possibility of a speed camera, to see what other safety measures that we can implement. Again, that's in our toolbox along right. that corridor. Um, I think if you phrase it in such a way, you know, this can probably be 
one of our SIPs project, which is a safety improvement projects where we know there's a problematic intersection within oh, the district wonderful. and we, we can evaluate to see what we can do in terms of short-term and long-term. That is great. Uh, Colleen, refresh our memory on one issue. Um, when we had the whole presentation about the rotunda redesign, we were then rerouting vehicles to 86th Street. Is, is that, was that correct, what I'm remembering? Um, I believe so, yes, I believe so. Okay, okay. Um, Jay, did you have something? I no, thought I saw no, you. No. No. I think we should. Can we okay. move on? So, so I guess the question is if we're gonna be calling for uh, traffic calming changes, do we need a resolution? Um, and probably I don't think do. it's appropriate to consider resolutions that weren't on the agenda without having advanced notice and complete language. And it seems to me that that we've got enough information and a request from uh, DOT to put it in letter form with all the possibilities. Uh, I think we should settle on that and move on. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable Time presenting a resolution that wasn't uh, noticed. I would be too. <laughs> yeah. Let's Thanks. move on. All right, um, Colleen and Dale and, and Mark and everyone who participated in this discussion, thank you so much. We are gonna take all of your thoughts and we're gonna incorporate it into a letter which will be distributed uh, to the committee and to get input. And um, we will get this out to Colleen as quickly as we can. And uh, thank you to Colleen for that uh, last bit of information. I think it's very helpful. Well, let's move Howard, do you want to uh, take the oh, next item? Um, sure. This The next one is a resolution that is totally noticed. It's on the website and it's, it's pretty um, straightforward, uh, which is somewhat unusual for our committee. There's, we all have, we all are very familiar with secondary street names. Um, most of the time we walk by them wondering who those people are. Well, to um, my surprise, there is someone in, in uh, a fellow New Yorker who maintains a database of all of those people and who they are. And uh, that person would like the city to take over that project from them. And uh, Ken has brought this to us and I'll let Ken, because he has uh, much more of the information and details on this, uh, discuss that the goal is to have the city uh, take over this database and institutionalize it so that we all have access to this, uh, this great resource. And Yeah, um, I just put in the chat if somebody could promote. Um, I just did, Ken. Okay. Thank you. Because um, he's, he's the man. Um, he created this uh, database um, uh, on the web um, seven years ago. Um, there's a New York Times article uh, about his efforts, uh, which I, I should have thought to uh, send to the committee. Um, and uh, um, it's this, it's an amazing resource. And I used it to create what we now have on our website, which is um, now anybody can go to our website and they see a name, uh, Reverend Henry Brown Boulevard, uh, they can go to the website and find out who Henry Brown actually was. Um, and, uh, and Gil has done this for the entire city. Um, but, uh, uh, Gil is not getting any younger, and <laughs> as not, and none of us are. <laughs> That's right. And um, uh, I was just going to ask you who is. <laughs> yeah, who is? <laughs> I was hoping I'd be the exception, but I'm not. Um, and uh, I would really be great if um, this should have should happen. You know, no matter what age anybody is, um, the city should really take this over. Uh, it wouldn't. Uh, I it's um I, I think Gil actually has an estimate as how much it would cost. It's only a couple of thousand a year at the most. Um and uh and it would it would actually could be a really great thing um if the city took it over uh, because they Yeah, you may recall, Ken, that um when we were doing our project on secondary street names, um we had I had suggested and others had suggested that at least community board seven for the for the secondary names in our district have it on our website and I believe it it was there for for a while uh, but as they expanded I don't know that it was kept up so this would be a great a great idea. 
Yeah. Well, it is now on our website, and and as long as I'm on the board, I'll take responsibility for updating it. But so, uh, should we hear from Gilbert then? Yeah. Yeah. Gil, you are you still here? promoted? So he's uh, visible now. Got to yeah, promote. There he is. You got, you got to unmute. I unmuted him, but yeah, I'm unmuted. It's on Gil's side, Andrew. Just the... Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, you know whether whether uh, uh, whether they use uh, my material or whether they find some way to you know some algorithm for taking the stuff directly from the city council uh, committee report, which is the way I do it. Um, if, if the city is going to take the trouble to memorialize people, um, you know, that memorial should um, should make sure that the, you know, that the people are really remembered, you know, as, uh, as was pointed out, you know, you can walk past some of these street names and, you know, like Henry Brown and and you know, wonder, well, you know, who was that? Why did they put a, you know, put up a sign about him? Um, and and you know, Henry Brown hasn't been gone that many years. Uh, you know, figure, um, you know, twenty-five or fifty years from now, some kid walks along the street and say, you know, why is that street sign up there? Why is this street named after John Doe? And you know. More than likely, the the parent is not going to know. Um, there are there are uh, you know you look around and New York street names are you know pretty orderly, but uh, there are a lot there are street names in some of the other boroughs and nobody knows who they were named after. In fact, there's one street name in Manhattan. It's up in Harlem. It's called Chisholm Place, and C H uh, I S U M. And I've made all kinds of inquiries. Nobody has the foggiest idea who or what Chisholm was. Uh, and if we're going to go to the trouble of of putting up these, you know, secondary street names, these memorial street names, um, uh, we we should make sure that uh, you know people can find out the reason why. I hope that's not a misspelling of Shirley Chisholm's name. It is not. It predates Shirley Chisholm. Okay. Huh. Uh, it was put up. It's in the vicinity of um, oh that that uh, middle income housing development in Harlem. I can't remember the name of it. Lennox Terrace. Yes, that might be it. That might be it. It's it's around there somewhere. Okay. Um, so Gil, let me ask you this. If you were if we were successful, if you were successful, if all of us and the city were to take this on, how would anybody know they could go to a certain website unless it was advertised somehow in at the bottom of these signs or or somewhere? Yes, it could be advertised at the bottom of the signs, you know. You know, there could be for example a collar um, around the uh, lower part of the the poll saying for information on street names go to uh, in European cities um, I've seen in a number of cities where the street signs are not as high as they are over here because they don't have to clear the traffic the way we do over here um, but where the street sign is you know just maybe in seven or eight or ten feet above the street they have a little tag on the sign. So it'll say, you know, Johannes Schmidt, zoologist, 1860 to 1940, something like that. But our street signs are too high up to do that. But you could have around the lower part of the pole, just a little. Yes, <laughs> wherever there's a secondary street name, you could have some a band around the bottom of the pole explaining. Yeah, yeah. 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 Now, uh, I also, um, it occurred to me this evening that I had seen someplace uh, on one of the committee reports, an estimate of the, in some, for some bill, there was an estimate of the budgetary impact of adopting the bill. And this was, this was back when they were still doing single street name bills. 
before they started ganging them up. And I believe the estimate was $280 for manufacturing and putting up a sign. That means that, you know, in recent years, we've had a hundred, roughly 120 to 140 signs, secondary street name signs put up per year. So that's, um, you know, that's somewhere like $25,000, $30,000. So if you're going to invest that much in putting up the signs, it would pay to invest a few thousand dollars per year in, um, in making sure that people can find out who the guy is, whose na- guy or gal is, whose name is up there on the sign. Now, uh, I, you know, this takes me maybe 40 hours a year. And I'm not, um, I'm hardly a, a whiz at, you know, at computer stuff. Um, I think the, the city agencies, be it uh, DOT or Department of Records or maybe even DOITT, um, they've got staff there that can probably do this a hell of a lot faster than I can. So I don't think on a citywide basis we're talking about um, any large annual outlay. I'd say a few thousand dollars. I, th- I think there are some questions about the, the methodology and DOT would then have to, every time they get a, an, a, an approval or the city council approves a group of names, they would then send it to this, to this department uh, in, in, in the city and they would then update their database. Is that, is that how you expect it would work? Yeah, well, it's what I do. I go online and I find the committee report for that bill. And it's got, uh, in addition to, you know, the text of the bill, they have um, the explanation of why, you know, like a biography or something of sure. why, the, why the thing was named for them. So I just take those, I just use, a, you know, I'm, I'm using Word, I just copy and paste into an Excel database and then you know I edit it in some cases and in some other cases um, uh, you know there's some information that's clearly missing like you know dates of birth and death or at least some idea of when the person lived because you got to think you know this is for people to look at many years hence yes yes Great. Can you take some questions? We have uh, some hands. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, Ken and Ken, and then Barbara. And meet yourself, Ken. <laughs> I didn't have a question. I don't know why my hand was up. I think it was oh, up. Okay, before. maybe it's still up from before. Yeah, Barbara, did you your hand up from before, or do you have something? No, I I do. I have a comment. Okay, first, sure. First of all, Jill. You are really to be congratulated for having taken this on and having done this for all this time. Absolutely. That's amazing. And um, I wanted to suggest that the resolution thank Mr. Tauber at the end, uh, which is really missing from that resolution because, uh, you know, it, it, it's just a wonderful thing that he did. And lastly, if you have access to our chat, someone named Anthony Pichette. Uh, has answered your question about Chisholm Place, so you can read his answer. He has. Yes, he has. He has. Yes, wow. Yes. Seven twenty-five. Maybe, maybe we should pause for ten minutes and play a game here. You know, like a <laughs> street game, and somebody wins and gets a resolution or something. <laughs> what was that Who Brooklyn you know, Street you were looking for, means. Gil? Sorry. Gil, you were looking for a Brooklyn Street. Maybe you should throw that out now, too. <laughs> Brooklyn Street. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> oh, uh, no, I... <laughs> it, was in the, it was in the Times article. Yeah, no, I don't remember what it was. I'm okay. Sorry. But um, I so... certainly will look up that uh, forgotten New York thing about Chisholm Place. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. You had it all. So, uh, Barbara, was that a friendly um, amendment to the resolution? Well, yeah, I, I, well, I guess so. Yeah, I didn't know if that was final wording, but yes, I would say that's what it is. Yeah. 
that's um, very, very appropriate. Um, well, thank, thank you. you for adding that. Howard? Uh, you have another- I think it's great. I, all systems go here. Great. Oh, Roberta, you, your yeah, hand is up. Your hand up so. Yes, I'd like to um, second the resolution. Great, All right, you. terrific. Are we ready to vote on the resolution? Yes. yes. Uh, okay. Um, all those. How do I record paper? the votes? I'll do. I'll, I'll help you out, Roberta. I'll give you the okay. vote. So. Okay. So, so let's. Um, do, I'll help you out, Andrew, as well. So if everyone can raise their digital hands. Well, you have and and physical hands as well. I'm assuming my hand. Well, these are committee members. Committee so, members. So One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I see nine committee members with digital hands up. And then I assume you and Howard. Yep. We're part of that. Yep. Eleven. Yeah. No, mine is up in in that in that number that. Uh, oh, so that that's just, ten. Howard's is not up. So that's 10. Howard's is physically that's up. So that's 10, um, 10 votes. That's 10. Now I'll lower those. Look at you. Um, Pro. And how about non-committee? Um, oh, any, any committee members opposed to that? No. Any committee members abstaining? No. Um, how about non-committee board members in favor of the resolution? Paul Fisher is a yes, that's one, and four digital, and Steve is five. So that's six, six um, in favor. Any uh, non-committee board members opposed? Oh, Robert Espia, that was seven. Seven uh, committee, uh, non-committee non board members in favor. Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that's pretty overwhelming. And Gil, we can't thank you enough for yep. all you're doing in this, and we will keep you posted. As I really we, uh, appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Really Ken. great. Thanks, Gil. Andrew. Thank you. Uh, thank you're, you all. you're a true resource. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> and Gil, I, I put in the uh, resolution. I don't know whether anybody, everybody saw it. That um, he has another website uh, that lists former street names in New York City. Oh, how uh, cool is that? And I think yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll just amend the resolution so there's a link to that in, in the resolution because I think- Oh, that's that wonderful. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, Gil. Thank you so much, Gil. Well, thanks. Howard, I believe you're up again. Oh, um, the next item are loading zones. Um, the, the committee is very well aware that about two and a half years ago, the full board uh, asked for additional loading zones and we've been waiting patiently ever since. And um, we were supposed to have a, um, uh, an update um, right after our old other meeting um, a day or so ago at Pincar, the Manhattan um, DOT commissioner had wrote us and uh, that letter was circulated to the committee um, but Steve had a great idea that we should, rather than just have this back and forth, we should have a meeting with Ed and figure out what's going on. So yep. uh, Steve, uh, Andrew and I are arranging for a meeting with Ed and you'll be the first to hear a report of that meeting um, as soon as it happens. Yeah, And that's Ed Pincar, Manhattan Borough Commissioner of yep. DOT. I'll, I'll reach, I mean, you saw my email, I'll continue and I believe it'll be amenable to some more detail. Great, uh, that meeting would be very helpful. And so we'll have a full report after that meeting. Absolutely. Great. Uh, all right, um, I'm gonna give you some MTA updates. Um, there's some very good news in that uh, we are about to get $6.5 billion in COVID relief funds, which will take away the uh, possibility of the draconian service cuts that have been threatened um, speaking of service cuts, you of course have heard about the debacle of the Long Island Railroad schedule that went into effect yesterday and how there was standing room only, no social distancing, um, and a half hour to an hour or more additional uh, time for people's commutes as they uh, try to quote, right size, unquote, service. Uh, that went over like a lead balloon. Every newspaper report, uh, the Long Island Railroad Commuter Council, um, 
uh, elected officials on the island and even Majority Leader Schumer, who got all of this money for the MTA and who was convinced it would mean no service cuts, was up in arms about these Long Island Railroad uh, changes. Some were amended this last night and this morning, but this evening it was announced that the old schedule, uh, which was basically 95 or 90% of the addition of the regular service would come back on, on the 29th of this month. So you know, 20 days, the old schedule will be back and that is great news for Long Islanders or anyone that needs to go on the Long Island Railroad. Um, you also probably know that um, there's now just two hours of the shutdown overnight for subway service, two to 4 a.m., which is great for our essential workers who did use the four to 5 a.m. Uh, hour very much to get to and from their important jobs. So we're slowly getting back to normal. Uh, Omni is on track to proceed with something that will be very terrific and unique to our area, which is something called fair capping. Um, with Omni, which is an open loop, it is going to be a little difficult if it's on your phone or on your credit or debit card, not on the MTA issued uh, Omni card, but on, on those other three possible uh, fair uh, payment systems to have the seven and 30 day, but fair capping means you will buy a certain number of trips, you will have so long to use it and anything that you, that you uh, that use above the amount of trips you purchased within the time limit will be free. So there will once again be an incentive to use the system um, because it's, it'll be free. So mm -hmm. that's great news. That's coming uh, hopefully later this year as will other ticket types or fair types on Omni. Um, another really good piece of news is that it looks like congestion pricing is going forward. The Federal Highway Administration and Secretary Buttigieg have told the MTA they will have an answer shortly. The uh, environmental impact statement, uh, whatever type they decide will be necessary, will be submitted. The governor will be impaneling the uh, Traffic Mobility Review Panel to discuss rates, times of day, days of week, uh, that the uh, congestion pricing will be in effect, who will be exempt, who will not. Um, and uh, we could be getting the first dollars of that uh, within about a year as uh, from the date this is approved, which would be great news for the MTA's capital program. Lots more accessible stations. We will be getting 12 more accessible stations in 2021, however. Um, none of them are on the west side, but they are all over the city, and uh, we look forward to getting the system much more accessible. There is now an accessibility chief for the entire MTA, Quimel Arroyo. He's a great guy, and I expect really great things from him. And uh, I'm done. And just so you know, Quimel used to work for DOT. He's amazing. Yeah, he seems like a wonderful guy. Robert. Andrew, is there anything in the works to uh, have the senior discount card usable on Omni? Absolutely. Um, I think by July or August, that should be accomplished. Um, the, the, head, the, the, the brains behind Omni is actually retiring in April, but he's got a great team and he gave me his phone and we, we're gonna stay in touch. And uh, this is gonna, I mean, tapping is so much faster. Yeah, you know, there's no swipe again. Here is none of having to clean the turnstiles. I mean, the tap is just instantaneous. It can be on your phone, on a on a debit credit card. So yes, the answer is yes. It's coming later this year. Excellent. Sure. Uh, Doug, is that your hand up? It is, Angie. You just shared some great news, and that's very exciting. And I have now come to habit of sort of giving my monthly report because yes. I often on public transportation and I support it. I'm on many buses and many trains and I am still very worried about non-compliance. I have never for months and months and months seen a single attempt of enforcement for people that are not wearing masks. And I've seen it in the last few weeks, I've seen something else that's disturbing on buses now, and the bus drivers, God bless them, I don't want them to be put, putting themselves into harm's way, but they are completely passive as they probably should be. I now see tremendous fare evading on buses. People just walk on, they walk by, and the bus driver just puts his hand up or her hand up and they don't do anything. I've had a few- We're talking about a single length bus or an articulated bus? 
Uh, no, no, single length bus, not a, not special. Wow. They, not the uh, select service. I've seen them go through the back door, but I've never seen, you know, just breezing no. by the driver. Like no, you're the drivers are my understanding because I've spoken to about a half a dozen drivers doing my own non-scientific independent study. And they tell me it's getting worse. We, do, we are advised not to confront anyone. Uh, we cannot. And I, I witnessed on, I, I may have said this in our committee, but if maybe I speak, maybe, so if I'm repeating myself, forgive me, but I saw nine young men uh, get on, on the bus, all didn't pay, all drinking alcohol, all not wearing masks, and the bus driver just, and I, so this is happening regularly because I'm on the bus regularly. I've asked when the um, person from the MTA was here, uh, I asked to date, how many violations have, how many summonses have been issued? Get back to you, don't know it. I'm not looking for the, this to be a revenue source. I understand education is the better way to go, but I speak to a lot of other people that are taking public transportation and the more it comes back, which we all want it to, the more people are gonna be populating the buses and trains, and then you have the social distance problem. So what are they doing about it? Doug, um, I'm gonna ask you again, and I have some good news. Um, if you can get me the, the vehicle number and the route number, I can get this to the proper authorities very quickly after it happens. But I, I'm, I believe that I will be successful. Um, I've been told I, I am going to be successful in getting the new uh, MTA chief, chief of police for our next uh, transportation committee in April, uh, Chief Kathleen O'Reilly. Um, I know the Eagle team is out there. They do enforce fare evasion and masks, but they are not everywhere, obviously. Um, and uh, I understand why the, op the bus operator can't and should not get involved. Uh, I totally understand that. Um, and their union uh, agrees with that, I believe, Local 100. So, but uh, you're, you're absolutely correct in this concern. Get me a, a bus and a route number, a vehicle number and the route number. And uh, I, I can take care of this in real time. Well, um, when you say there, I mean, first of all, when you, you were very helpful when I, I gave you information about bus drivers not wearing masks, right? Absolutely. You have their badge number, you have the bus number, but yep. um, the bus drivers don't seem to be reporting it. I mean, I, they have a lot of other things to do. They have to drive a bus, but of I mean, course. It, it, it's very clear that it's happening a lot. So it, it you know, um, but the, all the bus drivers have said to me that this is, this is the way it is. We can't do anything and we're, we're told not to do anything. So I, I, I buy a, an unlimited Metro card every month, 130 some odd dollars. And yeah. I'm just witnessing, you know, like it, 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 the word enforcement came up several times in this meeting tonight. And uh, no, uh, you're exactly right. Um, it's a horror. It, this massive fare evasion means higher and more frequent fare hikes for those that can least afford it. So, you know, this is, this is not good for the folks that are doing it or their neighbors or their friends or their families. It's just not good. And yeah. uh, I'm, I hope that uh, Chief O'Reilly will address this um, next month, but get me a, a route and a bus vehicle number where you see this happening and I will do my damnedest to, uh, to report it to the head of buses and he will get on the radio with the bus operator and or alert the Eagle team to meet that bus and uh, we'll see what we can do. Thank you. Thank you for using mass transportation. It's great. Um, uh, Rob, Robert, you spoke already, correct? Yes, I did. But uh, I, I did have a quick question on what uh, Doug is talking about. What, what the security cams on buses, I know they were active in part of the city for a while, but is that still a system that's intact? Because that could be tied into the uh, first time I've heard the term, the, the Eagles and the team that they could intercept a bus at the next stop sort of thing and, and see who it is. That Depending on where they are, of course. Yeah. 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 Is, is there such a thing still as the security cam monitoring? The Eagle team does frequently go on buses. No, no, in the most typical case, they're on an SBS bus because that is sort of like an honor system. You're supposed to use the machine get a receipt and get on board. So they're basically checking those, but they do do non SBS routes as well on a, on a random basis. I what personally have not seen the Eagle team in over a year and a half, to be honest. 
I've, I've in in since this whole program had begun, I've only seen them once on Fordham Road, once ever. But uh, what about the security cams on the cameras on the uh, buses? They're, they're live. They're alive. They're not being monitored in real time, but they're live. I see. I see. Rich so, has his uh, hand up. I'm Andrew, sorry, Roberta. Rick Robbins has his hand up. Yeah, I'm. I'm getting to. I just want to make sure Robert is finished. Yeah, that that was my question. Yeah, I Thank you, uh, Andrew. Thank you, uh, Robert. Uh, Rich, you are next. Yeah, thank you. Um, a comment and a question. The comment is, um, in terms of enforcement, my understanding is I think that a, a bus driver was killed trying to enforce uh, fare evasion. And at that point, the MTA decided bus drivers should not be doing enforcement. And I think that's the right decision, uh, whether it's masks or fare evasion. Uh, on the topic of SBS, um, fare evasion is very low on the SBS. It's very high on non-SBS. Um, but my question is a different topic. Um, I've heard that the trains have to keep running overnight, even though there's no service, um, which has raised questions. Do you have insight into why uh, there's no service when the trains are still running and also when there might be um, full overnight service restored? Yeah, um, they have to keep running because they're getting staff all around the system and the trains themselves have to be serviced in yards at other ends of the line. So they are continuing to run. They are keeping it closed for the two to 4 a.m. period so that they can do the cleaning that they were formerly doing in the one to 5 a.m. period. Obviously they've learned a lot and they hopefully can do as much cleaning in in the two hour period that they did. But however, they continue to clean trains throughout the day and stations as well. I have asked for a metric that could be put on their website where you could learn when your car or your station was last cleaned. And they found that very interesting and they're looking into that in the MyMTA app. So we will see if they can do that. But no, the trains must keep running and they do keep running 24 hours. Um, okay. So, um, you have two people. And why can't they be open for customers? Um, because they can do much more thorough cleaning and some of the cleaning they're doing, they don't want to expose customers to uh, some of the uh, um, solutions they're using and, uh, they, and, and the, uh, the ultraviolet that they're testing and all of that, they can't do that with customers. So they have to have it customer free. Uh, I believe that will likely return by right, thank you. mid to late summer. I'm hopeful. Andrew, you've got two hands in the uh, attendees. Yes, and I, I have, do. I have a small comment to make at the end, but let's let it. All Abby right. Uh, is Abby's know. is Abby's mic still good? Um, She's let, permitted. It's She's a he, up. but let me let I'm me sorry, make. Sure. <laughs> he can unmute himself. Hello. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. Uh, based on uh, what the gentleman said about buses and safety, I was just thinking uh, if we're not turning this into a police state, obviously, but it would be nice to have face recognition um, system set up. That way, the driver doesn't have to say anything, but if people come, they don't pay and they misbehave. There's something that tells us where they are, who they are, where they live, and the ticket could be on the way to them before they even know it. Is that possible? It's possible, and I've, I've asked for that, for the subways, for fare evasion of people strolling through the slam gates or leaping over the turnstiles. Um, yes. Th I think the police would love that, but there are, some, um, there are some folks that don't believe that facial recognition, is, you know, is, it would violate your civil liberties. So that's a battle that's ongoing. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I, I agree with you, that would be very helpful. Because they don't have to attack drivers or attack subway or MTA staff. It's just you break the law, you get home, the ticket is there waiting for you. Yeah, that, that would be. I mean, yeah. Yep, yeah, that, that's a great idea, Abby. Thank you for that. Uh, You're welcome. Um, okay, anything else on this topic? Well, Lisa has her. Uh, her, her she name. said it was new business. Oh, okay. Uh, um, 
All right, then I think we are done with this. Um, does that mean oh, we're I, ready for? I, I, oh, Rich, I, I, Steve, I, I just, you had something. Steve, I was just, of course. I, I was just going to let you. I don't know if you heard of the program, but I was speaking. I had a meeting with City Council Planning on another issue. They made me aware of a a program they're going to be rolling out, whether they call it a transit bonus, but it's going to be incentivizing um, any building on major roads such as 86, 96, 110 that's on the corner to create to upgrade the stations to um, ADA compliant. And uh, I think they said they're going to be bringing it out in the next 30, 60 days. Oh, that so, would be fabulous. So uh, just if, what, what is that, Steve? I'm sorry, I missed what you said. There is a program that they're going to be rolling out. So it's very early and I don't have all the answers, but I thought it was a topic that they're going to be incentivizing any building, any, any, any construction on a major road like 86, 96, where there's a metro station, that if it isn't ADA compliant, that there's going to be a program to bonus them and, and require that uh, certain things are done. And I know that they're going to be bringing this out in the next, they said by April, maybe May. So keep an eye on it, but you brought up MTA and you brought up accessibility. And uh, I yeah, think I think it's also out. giving a a, a, um, a building bonus to people for having done this, just so you I know. what it is. It's a bonus program. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. You know, Excellent. What the somatics are, but it was an interesting thing. And I think it'll be relative to us. Excellent. I got it for the minutes. Thanks. Great. I wonder, did, did it state at all what the circumference of the... Uh, of the building would be before it would be just the nearest station or or uh it was just you know. i mean the way they were presented to me and we'll get more details is it, it was sort of if, if you were on top of or if you were on 86 on the south east side you would be updating that one it was either mandated that there was an entrance they could build they could build one up like an elevator to the street so I think uh, I don't have all the details uh, and that's why I was reticent to say something, but the fact is you brought it up and I do think it's a program. That's, that's excellent. Yep. And we'll no, it's great. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay. Anything else on, on the MTA topic or should we move to new business, Howard? New business. New business. Uh, any committee members have an item of new business before we call on the public? All right, then Lisa, your, your hand was up first. Okay, great. Um, so it's new business, but it's kind of old business. Um, I'm curious with the Rotunda construction, if Colleen could also give us an update as to, and it might not be Colleen, it might be Parks, but what is happening with the uh, Rosenthal detour and Greenway access and all of that with the Rotunda construction, if, if that's been figured out. Um, so I'm curious about that. I also wanted to make a point that I wanted to make earlier about 79th Street. Um, and obviously we have this fabulous greenway that is the busiest bike path in the country. Um, and we could slow down traffic along 79th Street very easily with a bike lane that would connect the greenway to Amsterdam, to Columbus, um, and to the other infrastructure that we already have on the Upper West Side. Um, lastly, We've heard from members that alternate side parking is not working and that the streets are a mess. Um, apparently a ticket for leaving your car there and not moving it is only $65. So a lot of people are just not moving their cars. Uh, and it's, um, as you probably all know, it's pretty disgusting. And, um, you know, we have this one block that's doing this fabulous job of cleaning up, but that's not really, you know, their responsibility. It's really the, the car, the, the drivers should be moving their cars. So I wondered if that was something that the committee wanted to discuss and, uh, you know. Okay, let's take them, let's take them one at a time. Um, yep, <laughs> sorry. So your first item. Um, was wanting an update on the Rosenthal. On the, yes, uh, Colleen, that, do you that have anything? That would be Parks, that's Parks. I think it would be Parks, but. Yeah. Definitely Parks, it's definitely Parks. Okay, so maybe Ken, if you or anyone else on the Parks Committee can make a note, I, I can ask at that meeting as well, but I'd be curious what the update is on that. Um, so the second item was 79th Street would be a great way to connect the Greenway to Columbus and Amsterdam, and I'd love you to consider that as well. Um, and then the third was alternate side parking. Yes, not um, I have definitely noticed that my side of my block has not been cleaned in probably two months. Um, I've noticed the other side has occasionally been cleaned. Um, people are not moving their cars. 
um, alternate side has been suspended by the mayor so many times during this winter, obviously because of the snow and what have you, but um, it hasn't gone back to normal. And I think the committee should absolutely ask the Department of Sanitation why, and the Department of Transportation why this has not happened. Okay, you know, uh, the streets are gross. They're gross. Uh, it's Colleen from DOT. So this would be a DOS um, jurisdiction. Okay. I think if you let Penny or John know in the office, they can reach out to the superintendent and um, inspect those streets. Great. Uh, yeah, it's, it's district wide how bad it is, really. It's awful. I wondered too, does, does anyone know if West 100th between, you know, in front of the precinct, does it ever get cleaned? I mean, if, I don't understand how that can ever get cleaned because of double and triple parking on that block between Amsterdam and Columbus. Maybe we can uh, we, ask that question. We can certainly ask uh, Deputy Inspector Yaguchi. Um, he's been very good about getting back to us. Great. Well, maybe um, um, uh, one day a week is not working and uh, we need to revisit that. Yeah, if it was $130 a week for, for leaving your car, people might make a different decision. Yeah, and it's certainly not, it's not one day a week on my side of the street. It hasn't been cleaned in months. It's unreal. So, so yes, be a topic um, I think for... we will reach out to sanitation and see what the problem is or, or ask the office to do that. And perhaps make it an agenda item next week or next month? Uh, sure. Yeah, depending on the answer we get. Yeah, I think we should. If they say everything's going back to normal, um, it's great. But, uh, you know, they're, recycling is on the block for I can't tell you how long. It's just, it's unreal. Um, so, um, any other, let's see, there's other hands. Uh, Jay, is your hand up? Yeah, I just, uh, uh, I, I, I could pose it in the form of a statement or a question, but I understand. Whatever you feel comfortable. Some of the enforcement issue with alternate side parking uh, is pandemic related. And uh, because of the obvious logistics of people uh, not working, not moving cars, et cetera, et cetera. And that at least the anticipation is that at some point, uh, both the parking habits and enforcement will uh, make their way back to normal. Yeah, um, but that argument presupposes that the majority of these car owners are using their cars for work, and I don't believe they are. So the fact that they just not going out there it may be because they're working from home and they forget or who knows what, but it's, they're on Zoom uh, work, work projects, but it's, they're really not moving them, Jay. Oh, no, I, I, I agree that there's a lot less movement, but I'm saying I think uh, the enforcement policy adjusted to the realities of the pandemic, and certainly there are people uh, that take advantage of it, but uh, I, I suspect it, uh, will creep its way back to normal as the world creeps its way back to normal. <laughs> yeah, I, th I hope you're right. Uh, everybody says it's go all getting better. I do see increased ridership on the subways and what have you, but uh, we have an awful lot of traffic. That certainly has increased very quickly. Um, Rich, is this a new thing or an old, your old hand up? I'm just, it is a new thing. Answer that there still is a, a couple audience people. Um, make sure you don't skip them if you're going back. To uh, okay. Oh, I see one. Yeah. Uh, hold on before we do a repeat. Uh, Christina hasn't spoken. So let me, let me uh, promote Christina so she can speak. Do you want to go allowed to talk? Where are we, Christina? Here we go. Roll over. Allowed her. to talk. Yeah. Here you go. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I am just uh, wanting to, to talk really quickly about the protected bike lanes, um, which I use every day um, on Columbus and Amsterdam to take my kids to school. Um, they're seven and three and they ride in the back of our, of our bike. Um, and I just want to flag a safety issue that impacts our commute, um, which is pretty short from 93rd to 112th almost every day. Um, we've noticed that 
Con Ed or sometimes other contractors are working in the bike lane and they just will close the lane without offering any kind of safe accommodation for cyclists. And so often we're forced onto the sidewalk or into the street. And earlier in the meeting, we heard about speeding and it is a real issue going up Amsterdam where the trucks and the cars are going really fast, but we have no other option. There's no reroute. So um, it's my understanding that DOT had um, revised some kind of language about its permitting that contractors should be providing some kind of temporary and safe bike detour. Uh, but I, I don't think we have ever seen that. Um, and again, we encounter this every day. So I don't know if this is some kind of, you know, enforcement issue that can be addressed easily, but I did want to raise it. And then well, my let, second let's point- say, Let's see if Colleen has an answer to that. Um, yeah, since I, we're- I, I most definitely have an answer for that. So Christina, um, when we issue permits to contractors or utility companies or developers to do the work out there that they need to do. And if there is a bike lane, they are supposed to create a safe path for a cyclist along with signage that clearly delineates that, you know, this is, you know, the bike lane. What is the segment on, on is it 93rd to 111th on Amsterdam? Right, so that's our commute. We go from 93rd to 112. Is that the location where Con Ed is working and they're not, they're closing the bike lane, but they're not providing a route? Is that what it is? Yeah, so on Amsterdam, they're in the last two to three weeks, there have been um, at least three. One is longstanding. It's around, I think, 108th Street. Uh, then there were two yeah. others that popped up that have been subsequently repaved. So they're no longer an issue, but um, just, this week, there's been more Con Ed work on, um, I want to say 105th or 106th in Columbus, where they do have a sign and they have um, cones and a pole between the cones. And it says, construction and bike lane proceed with caution, but there's no way to get through it. I mean, there's no safe way unless you go up on the sidewalk and the sidewalk is very narrow and there are often people on it. So I, I, I would not call that a safe accommodation. I, and, and you know what? I totally agree with you. And I can have an inspector go to the site tomorrow just to make sure that they are in compliance. And again, just confirming the location, Amsterdam between 93rd and 112, right? This, this is actually on Columbus. And if I can follow up, it's the corner with New York plumbing supply. Um, I'm just looking at the picture I took earlier. Um, hmm? Can you give, can you provide the exact location? That would be helpful. Yes, I will. I, I, I have your email. I can follow up with you. Right. With Send the, me an email. The, that would be perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hey, Colleen, in, while, you're, while you're at it, would you mind um, sending us the language that DOT has for when contractors are in a bike lane so we can, so we can see what their responsibilities are? Sure. I can get that from our permitting office. Thank you so much. And this is Christina again, just in future, what, what are we supposed to do if we see a violation? I mean, I don't really want to come to a CB meeting like all the time to wrap on these people, but. You, um, you could email me, you have my email address. Um, you can email me and I would have an, or I will have an inspector go out there ASAP. Yeah, just give the exact location. Yeah. Yeah. If, okay, if you but you know, like what about everybody else who doesn't know about this? Like everyone else, the delivery workers who are out there every day this impacts them. Like there should be a, there should be just more enforcement of this. Yeah, I don't know how we would notify. It's, everybody. it's, you know what, you know what, Christina, it's complaint driven. And unfortunately, this is how we get to address a lot of the problems out there. Um, the contractor or Con Ed, they know it's in the stipulation that if it's a bike lane out there, that they have to provide a safe route for cyclists. They know that. And of course, there are some bad players out there that are not going to comply with the rules and um, that we permit on the stipulations for them to work out there. So by you, you know, letting me know or someone emailing me or contacting the community board, you know, I can take, you know, next steps and having an inspector go out there just to make sure that the site is in compliance and that Conet provide an additional um, route for cyclists, a safe route. Colleen, does 311 know how to handle this? Yes, 311 knows how to handle this. 
You could also call 311, but a lot of you have my information. It's better if you contact me directly. Thanks, Christina. Uh, no problem. Uh, Thank you. Andrew, there's, there is a question in the, the q and Didn't Christina have another uh, issue? Oh, apologies. Uh, I did. It was old business, sorry, that I had raised um, and I, I had spoken to Colleen about it. It's just about the, the intersection at 110th and Amsterdam. And I, I think there's more to come, um, but I maybe Colleen could flesh out a little bit more. We're talking about either um, a pedestrian indicator that could be changed so that bikes crossing that intersection onto the unprotected lane have more safety because right now we have to cut through on you know traffic coming up from behind us. So I, again, I don't know, Colleen has a further update in the week since I heard from her, but. Yeah, Christina, um, our signal division Argot is gonna make those changes. And I believe Kimberly Rancourt from my office has been emailing you the information. She had just said that it would be forthcoming, but I, I don't know if there's more to share. That's all I'm, I'm just raising it again at the community board. The changes were approved. And I think what she meant is that she's waiting on a timeline of when it would be implemented. And as soon as we have that, we'll share that with you and the community board. Thank you, thank you. Um, there, there is a question, Colleen, while we're on this topic, um, that has been typed into the Q&A. Has this board or anyone seriously looked into the idea of requiring an ID tag on bikes to, a, to aid in identification of the bike in the event of a stolen bike or reckless cycling? Do you, do you know anything? As part of our cycling program, which we did a few years ago and worked with um, businesses, there is um, an initiative where cyclists are supposed to wear a vest with an ID tag number and with the name of the business that they're working for, yes. Um, that was implemented a, a few years ago. And delivery cyclists should, be, have, should have that information on them at all times. I think this, was re this request was in, in terms of all bikes, just some ID um, tag in case your bike is stolen or, or somebody sees you driving recklessly, I think was the idea of the question. I, I, Not just, I mean, just delivery cyclists, but all cyclists. I, I, I mean, I, again, I, I don't know if this would be a legacy. Uh, the largest country in the world. I don't know if this would be a legacy that you would have to take up with your city council. Okay. Um, I think the last person now is Rich. Yeah, for Colleen, and this might be a little bit of heresy because it's 55th Street, but I think it impacts a number of people in our district. Um, the bike lane uh, in... Uh, Hudson River Park. As you're coming down, uh, the bike lane crosses a, um, an exit from the highway at about 55th Street for cars that are driving into the ferry terminals. And based on the signage, I can see cars are supposed to stop and bikes have the right of way. Um, I've had several times when I'm coming to stop and, and cars will go straight through that stop sign uh, once at about 30 miles per hour. And if I didn't know it and hadn't stopped, I would have been directly in the path of that uh, car as it was going very quickly. Um, there are two stop signs which are pretty effective, but there used to be paint on the uh, pavement with a clear line and a stop. And that paint has completely worn off and I'm worried that it's a real safety issue. So um, I'm wondering if there's a way to get the paint put back on the pavement. Uh, again, it's the, um, the service road exit from the highway going south at about 55th street going towards the ferry terminals. Not our district, but do you have an answer Colleen or maybe this is a question for community board five or four, five, I guess. Yeah, or I can, I can email you, I just uh, that community board. Yeah, Colleen, do you have an answer by any chance or? We have we lose problems of our own. I guess we lost Colleen. No, 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 I'm here, I'm here. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, you haven't lost me. Rich, can you email me? Because I'm gonna find out if this is under DOT's jurisdiction um, and I'll, I'll, I'll see what we can do with the restoring the faded markings.
Yep. Hey, uh, and Doug, great. Doug, and if Doug I could just say great. something, if, yeah, if, I ahead, could, if I can just Same. add one thing, I, I think if somebody, people mute. Some, somebody's not muted. If I can just add one thing, if you know the board have service requests or issues, feel free to email me. Don't wait, you know, at the transportation committee meeting to raise it with me because by then I can have an answer for you. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me know because you know I'm more than happy to handle them. You know, don't feel like you have to wait when we have the transportation committee meeting to let me know. Feel free to you know reach out to me and send me an email. Okay. We'll feel free to bug you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, Doug, is your hand up? Yes, I, it was just a follow up on something that Colleen said. Um, on BCI, we do our best when applicants come before us to ask them if they're going to be having delivery and if they're going to be having their own delivery uh, workers or third party. And um, the question I have is on the requirement for vests and identification, does that carry on into the third party delivery companies or is it only the um, delivery workers that work for the establishment? Because I'm seeing a loophole here. You know what? I believe it's delivery workers who work for the establishment, the restaurant establishments. Right, and that's that's the that's the rub because many many of the, many restaurants are actually going away from that model and using the third party delivery. Um, there was a you know some of the some of the riders that are reckless. There was a push uh, to not ticket the individual. Uh, riders because they were hardworking people and there were immigration issues and all sorts of other things. And then there was a push to, to summons the establishment. Well, one of the ways the establishments have been getting away with this is by not hiring anyone anymore. So the third party deliveries companies, the Uber Eats, the DoorDashes of the world and, and so on, um, don't seem to have any, um, uh, it, we have no way of kind of encouraging them to ride safely, uh, or, or again, here goes, here's that beloved word enforcement. So um, that may be more of a, B, a BCI issue, but well, actually it is a DOT issue. I, I mean, if um, you, it, it, to be honest with you, Doug, I mean, if you know of restaurants who are doing this, I mean, we have our commercial safety uh, division. Um, they can go out there, they can, you know, talk to the businesses. But no, again, I'm, I'm saying it's it's the third party delivery companies that um, restaurants are not responsible for because they're not their employees or their contractors. Yeah, and, well, that's, that's and, a different issue. That would be a yeah, total. So we'll, we'll have to yeah. we'll have to brainstorm about There's, that. Yeah, gray line on that. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, Ken, was your hand up? Was, yes, it was. Um, Colleen, I just had a real quick question, um, and this is actually uh, Hudson River Park issue, but I thought maybe you might know something. The, all of a sudden it was announced that the state is spending $5 million um, between 57th and 59th um, near the Marine Transfer Station to upgrade the bike and pedestrian path there. Do you know um, why this is happening? Um, there already is a bike path there, so people are asking me, including the West Side Rag, why, why is this uh, happening. Do you have any information? You know what, Ken, I don't have any information, but uh, I recommend that you reach out to Penny and ask her. Maybe she can reach out to someone at state to get the information. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I believe we have, um, Abby, are you, are you, is your hand raised again? Yes. Oops, sorry. One second, I'll keep, get you back on here. Okay, you can talk. It is about uh, delivery drivers uh, working for third party like Uber, DoorDash, and Co. I was at um, uh, a local prison on uh, Canal Street like about a year and a half ago. And what they told me was that they expect every biker to come in and register their bikes with them which means if anything happens, they, they can easily trace them. And then I was like, okay, is it possible to give them some kind of training after collecting details about their bike, which means they don't ride on the wrong side of the road, they don't ride on a curb, and they don't go against traffic. And um, I wasn't given any answer to that. I think that would be a good way to go. It will be easier 
if people drive against traffic, it will be easier to track them and give them tickets or whatever. So because they're responsible for that. I don't think Uber or any or Postmate will be willing to pay for their ticket. And also, I think when people are riding bike, I think a company like Uber or Postmate track where they're going. So they should have something to at least tell them not to go on the right way or the wrong way or to follow whatever they have on their GPS. I think that might be a way to go if they could just uh, register the bike, that would be the beginning. Then the next is to um, put them through a kind of uh, road safety uh, training for about a week before they can go and ride anywhere. That would be great. In this city. Yep, that would be great. Thank you there, for that, Abby. There's a great- uh, You're welcome. Can yeah. I comment on that? There's a, great, there's a great New York Times article from a year or two ago by Andy Newman who signed up to be a delivery cyclist for a few of these services. And these services basically expect that the cyclists break the law and that there's no way for them to do the deliveries that are expected of them while complying with the law. So I don't know that these services would try to get their cyclists to follow the law. I think they're doing the opposite, uh, which is really concerning. Uh, he also said that it was very difficult to even make minimum wage based on what these services pay. So I think it's a real problem where the restaurants are um, relying on these services to do delivery. And then these services are um, really forcing cyclists to put themselves in danger, put other people in danger and, um, and break the law. And again, I don't think it's the cyclist's fault. I think it's the services because the cyclists are you know, often immigrants. They, uh, could be undocumented and they're just trying to, they're struggling trying to make a living. So I think the issue is a lot more with the services and uh, it's a real problem. It's a problem. I think everybody acknowledges that. Uh, but, uh, oh, uh, Mark, your hand is up. Yeah, and then, we're gonna, just... then we're gonna, I think, adjourn for the evening. Yeah. Oh, great. So I'm holding up the meeting. Um, I was just asking Rich, I'm asking Rich if this is, um, are these guys, you know, restaurant workers are uh, have a lower minimum wage because they are there's the presumption of tips, and we're all learning an awful lot about how that is discriminatory and not and comes from a bad place. Uh, is that the case with these delivery guys as well? I am not an expert on this. I know that the article by Andy Newman talked about how the tips were counted against his salary, wow. uh, and that was something that. Um, because of his article, the um, I forget whether it was a Grubhub or which service it was, but they changed their practice because of that. Right. Um, where they were guaranteeing whatever salary, but if you got a tip, uh, that money essentially went to the company, not to the delivery person. Yeah. And yeah. thanks to him, that got fixed. Well, this is obviously something that our board should should look into, but not tonight. Um, and probably with BCI, right? I mean, um, or at least with- I would argue also with HHS. And I've been saying for years, we should have a joint meeting with uh, transportation, BCI and HHS, which I, I had been in the process of trying to organize, but I guess I'm not in any of those committees now. So someone else should take that on. But I think it's really a, a largely a human service issue. Um, BCI has mentioned having flight. a joint meeting about this. Yeah, I'm not on any of those committees either, but I'm glad to stick my nose into that. Well, Thanks Richard, for bringing it up. Richard, I can uh, I can raise it with uh, HHS. And yeah, because it's really it's an but immigration I'll issue, it back and to you so that we can coordinate the other two committees. But I'll I'll bring it up and I'll send uh, uh, <clears throat> Shelley and Catherine an email on it that we discussed this. Tonight. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. And all I had started putting it together a few months ago, but then I got removed from transportation. But all the all three committees were uh, in favor of doing it. Hey, Mark, why don't the two of us work on it? I know that I asked to be involved in that, but wasn't in included. I think I was involuntary taken off that part of the meeting, but uh, we'll take it from here, Rich. I think we're going to move on it. And thanks, everybody. I think we've had thanks, a great everyone. Week. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank a great you. Night. Thanks, thanks for allowing me. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.